So thank you everybody for uh, spending some of your time with me this morning. Um, my name is Carlos Rodriguez. I'm originally from Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, I actually am a veterinary pathologist at Animal Kingdom. Uh, I started my career as a clinical veterinarian. When I graduated from veterinary school at Tufts University, I decided I was going to be an equine veterinarian. So I worked for a few years as a horse vet in Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, then decided that pathology was more my calling and went back to a residency program. And I was very fortunate that, that, um, that I got hired out of my residency at the Bronx Zoo. So I got a fantastic, um, fantastic education at, at the Bronx Zoo initially for my first few years. Uh, also, that's when I got to meet Louise through the conservation program support and got to work with, with amphibians in, in Latin America uh, and got to make the connections with Amphibian Arc. So I'm very, very happy and grateful for uh, Louise and Amphibian Arc for all the experiences that they've provided and for this opportunity to chat with you guys today. So let's get started. Um, this is going to be a lot of theory with a few um, a few exact case examples sprinkled throughout so that so that we can get to the point points across but this is basically um, this this talk is basically a it's not advancing the talk is stuck that's what the talk is hang on one second there we go um, so I'd like to start by by thanking uh, Luis Carrillo and Fabian Hart for for granting me this opportunity of course, a lot of the information and, and, and photos and cases and things like that are, are in the time that for me to be here are all made possible because of my current employer at Disney's Animal Science and Environment. And also uh, a lot of the concepts and things that I'm gonna explore are, are, were also highlighted by experiences at the Wildlife Conservation Society. And of course, none of the presentations that, and pictures and anything that you'll see here are possible without the massive help from colleagues and friends. And if you take anything away from this lecture is to, to just uh, work really, really hard and pay close attention to your professional and friends, colleagues network, because that is, how you, um, that is how you promote excellence in the field. And that's how you create these connections that, that do help you and help uh, others achieve their goals. Um, in conservation. I'm going to show you guys this picture because it's one of the, it's kind of the basis for this entire talk. It is, and it's based on the Manual for Control of Infectious Disease and Amphibian Survival Assurance Colonies and Reintroduction Programs that was written by Alan Pessier um, and Dr. Mendelssohn, both uh, fantastic individuals. And these were proceedings from a workshop in 2009, but the principles are very, very applicable. So a lot of what I'm going to talk through um goes based on that so what we'll cover is biosecurity principles and we're going to use um one of something that we've been using here at animal kingdom lately to kind of really extend it into areas that has not been done before uh, is, is how to use a risk assessment tool to to really determine what are the things you need to do and we'll go through some case examples on how how to approach this from from that perspective uh, we'll talk a little bit about disinfection and uh, concepts and general information, and also wrap it up with with a little bit about quarantine and the importance of quarantine. So when we talk about biosecurity, what we're really talking about is a management practices, a set of behaviors basically that are there to protect the environment and its native species from the introduction of exotic pathogens. That is the basis of biosecurity. You want to keep what you have, say, inside from going outside. So specific procedures and practices that govern management, husbandry, medical care, workflow, everything that's associated with the husbandry of these animals. And what it does is it, it, it helps mitigate the risk that is inherent in maintaining captive uh, collections of non-native animals um, under managed care in zoological facilities. Now, um, a lot of this we do already uh, or at your facilities. Um, some of the mitigation strategies that you can use are having your facility within the native range of the, spe of the species that are being exhibited. So nature centers are a great example of this. Uh, they're typically located within the native range of local species and the risk there is minimal. So we'll talk more about this, but uh, building, um, having aptic quarantine programs, uh, having a bio 
security program with that manages your your best practices type uh, approach to to the husbandry uh, having animals from known sources as opposed to wild caught or from uh, from undocumented sources having a health history database and also investigating and diagnosing morbidity and mortality events and disease surveillance that's actually a critical component of the risk mitigation strategies so talking about pathogens and what are what what's the importance of pathogens and i found this graph from um, a very very old article uh, and i've used it in other presentations before but it really shows an interesting um an interesting uh, balance that happens when you have pathogens and animals or even humans in the uh, in, in sort of living in this balanced ecosystem. So this is a graph that shows a human population over time, over thousands of years. Uh, and it's, you know, it's showing an incre a trending growth. A uh, little dip was the Black, uh, black, black Plague in Europe. Um, and then right about here, we discovered antibiotics. We discovered that diseases were caused by microorganisms that were not caused by some religious deity that was angry at the world. Um, it was caused by things that we could do something about. And so we started down a path of modern medicine, which I'm very thankful for, but also uh, that resulted in us eliminating a lot of the diseases and, and, and pathogens that affect us. And so you can see the population growth. Now, this is not just because of antibiotic discovery. There's a lot of factors that went into this, but modern medicine and taking care of um, our health was one of the main reasons why the human population has really exploded. So a healthy ecosystem requires a balance of pathogens uh, and animals. So where do pathogens come from? And again, uh, please excuse my, uh, this, is, this is what happens when I'm bored at home and I start playing with animations and PowerPoint. So hopefully this will work and make sense. So pathogens are normally in the environment. And as you can see in the savanna in Africa, you have lions and zebra and a number of other animals, and you have these little pathogens. Everybody uh, has a balance of these pathogens. They often co-evolve together, and they cycle often between two or more hosts, um, and they can maintain the balance like that. Now, why is this important? It's because you want to prevent that transfer of pathogens from animals that are not uh, used to those pathogens. So the scenarios are this. There's three scenarios. The first one is you bring an exotic animal into a new geographical location, and that's a very, very common uh, scenario. So you have your lion lives in Africa. He moves to a undisclosed location zoo in the U.S., anywhere or any, actually anywhere in the world, in Europe and Southeast Asia, anywhere. And that lion comes along to a new city with its own little pathogens. Now that lion because of transport and a number of other things that can happen, that could be a stressful event that results in that lion's uh, immune system becoming a little compromised and a shedding of pathogens occurs. Um, and also pathogens can overwhelm this uh, debilitated immune system and then you have manifestation of disease. Now, this is really important in, in a quarantine period. That's why we have a quarantine period because a quarantine period is also a moment of time where you can have manifestation of these diseases. So, uh, so it's not just to, to acclimate the animal, but there's also a period of time where you can have a uh, given opportunity for the manifestation of diseases before you introduce an animal to your collection. Now, another scenario that commonly happens is you can have an exotic animal in close contact with other exotic animals. And this happens commonly in zoos. Um, in Aquaria as well, where you have just not your line, but you have a number of other animals there. Um, and you can have your pathogens on that lion transferred to other animals. Now, the fact that uh, some animals may be susceptible to them, some may not, but you don't know that. And you can have an outbreak of what, what's called an exotic disease. And an example of this may have been um, West Nile virus, for example. I mean, we're not sure how it got into the States, but it got into the States and then we found out that it spread to a number of naive species that they were not, that didn't have a, um, natural uh, immunity to those diseases. And so horses, people, flamingos, um, et cetera, uh, became uh, victims of that virus. Now, interestingly enough, all these other animals also have their own pathogens. So now, you are doing a two-way transfer of the potential of two-way transfer pathogens to which your little lion here would not be uh, immune to. And finally, you can have these exotic animals in contact with native wildlife. And uh, again, we'll see this uh, in, a, in a few seconds, but 
um, most zoos are the only green spaces that are left in urban in the urban environment, and they uh, they are the native they're the refuge for a lot of the local wildlife. So here again, just like with the exotic animals at the zoo, you can have transfer of the pathogens from the lion out into these animals. Some of them may have may be susceptible, and then you have an outbreak of an exotic disease in a new location. And then these animals also carry their own little pathogens uh, and they can transfer that to your lion. So these are kind of ex very simplistic examples of how disease transfers, transfer may occur among species. Uh, and just to put it in context, it's really not, uh, I'm not really making something up. If you look at the landscape of New York City, for example, uh, it, it's an urban, uh, pretty much an urban environment and only where you have green spaces is where you also tend to have the parks and the recreation areas and also the zoos. But because they're only, they're the only green spaces available, that's where the refuge of local wildlife, uh, that's where local wildlife goes to live in there as well. So you, it, it's not really a theoretical exercise, this actually happens on a day-to-day -day basis at, at uh, zoos all over the, the country. So. Talking about biosecurity again a little bit, um, having 100% biosecurity is unrealistic. It's not practical. It's, it, you can achieve a high level of biosecurity, but the higher the level, the less practical it is for actually being able to work there. So you just wanna shoot for a well-designed, solid, robust biosecurity program, where you actually look at the practices that you currently do that present risks. You identify potential vectors for disease transmission and you address them and that any risky practices that involve sharing tools, uh, sharing equipment, sharing personnel, uh, you have to address those as well. And all actions must be efficient and simple to implement, otherwise you will have breakdown of your uh, processes. So what well, your goals are to prevent the release of an exotic pathogen or disease. So in theory, nothing leaves the facility and goes out. Uh, you prevent the entry of local pathogens or diseases or nothing comes into the facility that's unaccounted for. And then you prevent the transfer of pathogens, diseases within the facility. So nothing moves between the concept of bio, uh, between biological units. So let's introduce that concept. A biological unit and, and, in, that, um, and in that amphibian uh, conservation uh, uh, security and int introduction guide that I referred to earlier, uh, they, really talk, they really focus around what are these biological units? So pay some attention to that and, and, and think about how you can design your programs in a way that you can manage them as these separate and independent biological units. But it is the smallest workable unit that can be managed efficiently under the same level of biosecurity. So you can even have a group of, of you can have several um, groups of animals that are managed as a single unit. And again, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an all in, all out, and concept that applies to quarantine, uh, any group for reintroduction, et cetera, where you, you treat that unit, you don't add things, animals or, or enclosures to that unit. You, it's, it's, a, it's a single unit that's immutable and you manage that entire um, group as a single unit. So let's do an example through this. Again, I apologize for the, the animation here. This is a prototypical zoo somewhere and you have your amphibian and reptile house on the top left. Um, and so you can have actually have a single animal be considered a biological unit, and then you treat that animal separate from all the others. And you isolate, you basically do an isolation ring around that animal. You can have a group of animals. It can be a species that's housed in a certain enclosure. It can be an area of the, of the facility that has uh, houses those species specifically or it can be the entire building. You can have an entire building that you manage and you have only keepers designated to that. You can have a, pro a process that involves only that building, but that building is essentially isolated from the rest of the zoo. Now, you have to do this looking carefully at your efficiencies and your staffing and a number of other external factors. So again, you can have any, any what, you do, what you end up defining as a biological unit is, uh, it's up to you on your, on your program. There's no standard approach, but you have to do this based on a risk assessment and um, always have a plan, a worst case scenario kind of a plan, uh, because that will save you um, response time. And it will also uh, give you some assurances that you're ready for uh, a breakdown in those biosecurity processes. 
and then of course all work in one whatever unit you design uh, you designate uh, all the work there has to be completed before moving to another so you don't transfer anything back and forth between these independent isolated units so this is the risk assessment matrix that we've been applying to now this is not something new this is not something that we created or designed or innovated in it's basically we do this every single day of our lives on the most menial things uh, all the way to the most uh, important events so it basically takes into account the probability of an event happening and what would be the impact of that event and that allows you to place that event in a um, somewhere in this in this in this um, box and then based on that you you take the measures that are appropriate to that to mitigate that uh, risk so it can be something as simple as you and I, you know, you get in your car and you, um, what's, the imp what's the possibility of you uh, getting into a car crash? You know, if you drive safe, you, you know, you're not speeding, you go to your, you, you rest before you drive, so you're not falling asleep, you don't drink, uh, you do all those things. So your probability of your accident is probably low. The impact of you getting into a car crash would be high. So you do, you take additional measures, like you put your seatbelt on, you drive the roads, the routes that you already know, um, things like that. So you keep away from this high risk things. Now you apply this to a zoo. What's the, in this example, what's the risk of a zebra escape? It can happen. We've seen it happen uh, at other zoos, other facilities. You hear about animal escapes. That's why we prepare and drill for those things. The impact would be high. You have an animal escape, depending on the animal. If you have a, you know, uh, one of the goats from the children's who escaped, that's not a big deal. But if you have a tiger escape, that is a big deal. So the probability that it happens depends on exhibit design, your staffing, security, all these things. So somewhere in here, you land with the probability of animal escape. And depending on where you land, uh, you take additional steps like expanding your, um, your training for animal escapes or, or you increase the size of the fencing or you put additional barriers in place or protocols in place. So you protect yourself and you protect that animal from the event potentially happening. So let's do a couple of, let's do a case example of this. So this case involves a Kihansi spray toes. Now this is a collection, this is a species that is only found in the Kihansi River Falls in Tanzania. Now this was a really interesting species because they're live bears. So you can see a little picture with a baby um, meta, post-metamorph uh, Kihansi spray toad uh, sitting on top of the, the parent. Um, they're very, very tiny uh, toads, and they're really interesting. They, they're endemic to that area, and people had started studying these animals when they realized the population was crashing suddenly. And this happened um, because of a waterfall. These animals live in a very, um, ex very, very unique environment where they have, they're on, this, uh, on the gorge of the Kihansi River where there's a big waterfall, and it creates this um, mist, and that's the environment where these animals would live. Now, what happened is in the development of African, of, of, of Tanzania uh, economy, the World Bank financed the formation of a dam of the Kiansi River upstream of the falls, and the water flow really reduced. And that resulted in a population crash because of the change, a sudden change in the environment. So biologists were in place and, and they acted quickly. And so a lot of population, a lot of the animals were taken into assurance populations, some in the United States and other places. So this is actually what happened. Uh, this is the normal falls in 1999. And after the dam was built, the flow basically got knocked down um, significantly. So all the greenery area, all that environment where it was all constantly being misted by these waterfalls dried up significantly. Now other species moved in as well. Well, we had these animals in our collection at the Bronx Zoo, and they had they were on a permanent post-entry quarantine scenario with biological units set up, uh, managed by an individual dedicated keeper, and nothing moved between units. But we did we and we're doing fine until we one day um, came in and found number of 22 of the frogs dead that day, um, 11 on the second day, and within 10 days we had lost the entire uh, one entire um, tank of these frogs, of these toads, sorry. Uh, we found a diagnosis because we had a pathology program there and, a, and an animal health team uh, on site and the keeper teams were very quick to respond. We diagnosed it very quickly via cytology and confirmed uh, chytridiomycosis. If you haven't seen it before, this is what it looks like on histology. These are the zoospores and the irritated hyperkeratotic skin. 
um, we were able to do to do the diagnosis either. So we knew what happened at the time. Now the interesting part is that because we had these biosecurity protocols already in place, the mortality, and you can see how this is one side of the room. We have four tanks on one side and four tanks on the other. Uh, the mortality event only affected one uh, one tank. And now it, it, it isn't, this, this, this happened like this, not because of luck or because we were fortunate. Uh, an outbreak of disease can happen to anybody. We took all the measures necessary to prevent this from happening. However, it happened. And the reason it got confined to only one system as opposed to the entire, uh, the entire room and the entire species that we had at the, at the time in the collection it's because we had a very strict biosecurity measures and protocols in place and the keepers were comfortable with those protocols and practice these protocols and nothing from one, one tank went to another. So, um, so it was a really interesting event and in that it highlighted the importance of having these protocols in place that we didn't use cage cleaning equipment from one to the other. We didn't transfer uh, plants or anything, any substrates or anything like that from one tank to the other. Every unit was managed in this case Every, every tank was a biological unit. So that saved that species from going extinct in our collection at the time at the Bronx Zoo. And so uh, it was a great effort. It was very scary for the keepers at the time. You suddenly have mortalities in a system that was stable uh, without knowing what it was. So, so again, communication, working closely with your keeper teams, working closely with your veterinary team, working closely with your husbandry managers, uh, all those things are key, and having this protocol is what saved that species from us. Um, so again, we already talked about all of all of this, um, and again, the the we had planned this biosecurity protocols for this particular species in this particular room under a worst case scenario because these guys are part of a reintroduction program, and some of them have been successfully reintroduced already back into the. Uh, Kihansi River Gorge. Um, but you want to make sure that you have ability to respond to a sudden outbreak of a contagious disease within these secure areas. And again, this is what we, we apply. This is an example of applying that outbreak of disease or introduction of disease. The impacts would be huge and pretty severe. The probability you want to minimize this in order that you stay away from the red zone and you um, you make it so that it is an acceptable level of risk because that's what we have to live with. We have to live with an acceptable level of risk and the mitigation strategies to minimize that. So again, those strict biosecurity measures prevented farther spread of the disease from one tank to the adjacent tanks and the rapid response was critical because we actually added, added additional isolation procedures in place to make sure that now that we had an outbreak of disease that that disease was kept confined. And again, uh, kudos to the keeper team there because they were instrumental in that response. And they were, the, they were there on, at the front line of this whole event. And it can be scary. So how do you design a program? And this again is, is specified in that uh, manual. It's, it's a little convoluted, but it basically takes you, you have to break it down into three things. You have to consider the role of the animal or the species the location of the facilities are gonna live in in relation to the native range of the species that are maintained. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then what type of the facility is? Is it a zoo with multiple different species from multiple different parts of the world? Or is it a nature center or a education program in a school with animals or a local farm? You know, you gotta take into consideration that. And then you have two approaches. Best practices is what we should be doing normally on a day to day is a standard, um, biosecurity measures and then I so you may you may or may not be familiar with the Kianzi spray toads uh, these are um, should I wait please or continue on I think you can uh, go ahead please okay I think it looks like you have five people waiting at the, at the waiting room okay I, I got um, them. perfect thank you so much again apologize for apologies to all for the, the minor glitch here so, uh, so you may or may not be familiar with the Kihansi spray toads. These are fascinating little species of toad. They're only found in the Kihansi River waterfalls in Tanzania in a very narrow gorge. That's, that's their extent of their, um, their range distribution. And they're really cool because they're live bearers. So it's a little post-metamorph uh, toad sitting on top of uh, a parent. And they, live, they're, they're, they went extinct in the wild um, back in the 90s. 
um, back in the 90s, um, after biologists have been studying this little new recently discovered uh, toads, uh, and they realized the population started to crash rapidly. And so they took a number of these animals and established assurance populations in the US and um, a couple other parts of the world. Now, the this, this to these toads are uh, specialists and they live in a very specific high humidity uh, environment in, this, in these waterfalls. And what happened was uh, in the development of the uh, country of Tanzania, the World Bank fund financed a, a, a development of a dam upstream from the Kihansi Gorge. And so water flow was actually reduced significantly um, between uh, one, you know, 1999 and the year 2000, you can see the big difference in the water flow. Uh, and it, what it resulted in is the drying out of this landscape and the frog, the toads couldn't, um, you know, the population started to crash. So fortunately we were studying, these animals were being studied and the population was able to be uh, rescued into a number of zoos. Now we had them at the Bronx Zoo and we had set them up with, for potential reintroduction and, um, and you'll see the setup in a second and as individuals. And so we had them in a highest level of biosecurity. And then suddenly we started to see a mortality event develop in these animals. And uh, the keeper came in one day and found 22 animals, almost half of the tank uh, was dead. And uh, so it was immediately raised all kinds of alarms. Uh, unfortunately, the mortalities continued. And in about 10 days, we lost the entire tank of, uh, of toads. The diagnosis basically was chytridomycosis. We did it initially rapidly by cytology, confirmed with histopath and PCR because we were lucky that the Bronx that we had an on-site clinical team and an on-site pathology team, we were able to really jump on this. Uh, unfortunately, we could not save the remaining toads. Uh, it turns out that these um, toads are exceedingly sensitive to chytrid fungus. And if you haven't seen it before, this is what it looks like. These are the zoospores and this is the epidermis uh, hyperplastic and, and irritated epidermis of the toad uh, with the with the chytrid fungus uh, in it. Um, so, so what ended up happening was uh, this is the way it was set up. There was four tanks on one side of the room, four tanks on the other, and this is a tank that was affected. One tank adjacent to others. And now it was what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the fact that we had a very intense uh, level of biosecurity at the highest Point where we had defined each of these tanks as a biological unit and the keeper that was there was very comfortable with the protocols and the procedures uh, for this. This was uh, a mortality event can happen to anybody at any point uh, is the effects of that event uh, that you are want, you want to control. You want to minimize the risk but you also want to contain the damage that can be done by that event. So the fact that we lost one tank but mortality, the, the disease did not spread to adjacent tanks and again I'll have you know Chytrid fungus is a it's a it's a very contagious, easily transmissible disease through water. So, uh, so again, uh, kudos to the keepers for jumping on this super quick. Uh, again, nothing goes between these biological units. This illustrates the, the point that that uh, when you define one unit, you contain everything to that unit, and nothing goes between uh, adjacent units. So we were lucky, and and of course. Uh, Having and having a, a system already in place where people were already familiar with the protocols and the processes, and we were able to contain this to minimize the damage. Um, again, because these were planned under a worst case scenario, each tank was defined as a biological unit, uh, highest level of biosecurity, because these were all part of a reintroduction program, and the offspring of some of these original toads have already been released back on site um, with some mitigation into developing. Uh, uh, misting systems for that area. It's a qu quite a fascinating program. If you don't know much about it, uh, you should look it up. And then uh, to prevent introduction of diseases, again, into the wild. Um, so again, we did that risk assessment matrix, uh, considering the outbreak of a disease within the systems and also introduction, introducing these diseases, uh, which the impact would be really high on both counts. So uh, we took the mitigation strategies to, to make sure that, that that did not happen by maintaining these animals in a permanent, um, to make sure that we had these in, in, in mind for, um, for possible uh, events like this. So um, again, fantastic that we were able to contain this, uh, dedicated keeper staff and you provide that, we provide the training and the um, practice scenarios so that this would be contained. 
And so each tank was matched by a logical unit. We did prevent, we talked about this already a little bit. Uh, what I wanna highlight here is that uh, keepers are the, you guys are the frontline keepers that are there are what, uh, what drives these responses quickly. So uh, fantastic job there. So to design the program, you have to take into account uh, three things. Uh, this is all information from that uh, infectious disease manual. And it, it's a little bit hard to, to piece it together from there, but here's the, the basic principles of it. You will need to take into account the role of that species, the location of the facility where that animal is gonna be, and the type of facilities. And you're gonna have two approaches, basically, that you're gonna mold your biosecurity program around. Best practices, which is kind of the basic level of, of good, solid biosecurity that you need to have on your day-to-day -day practice. And then you ramp that up in isolation uh, protocols. Um, both of these are designed very similarly. They're designed to protect health, prevent introduction of diseases into, into your animal program, and to prevent the escape of pathogens from that program out into the environment. Now, if you're gonna do apply isolation principles, you have to take that one more step, which is to prevent the unintended release of pathogens during reintroduction. So you've got to really keep those animals in a closed up and, um, scenario. So you're gonna look at the role of the species. It's, it's, uh, they can fit into any of these number of roles. You can have them at serve an arc rescue or assurance population role, which the intention is to save a species or reinforce the species and reintroduce into the wild. So some programs and some zoos work in this scenario. Uh, ex situ conservation programs are part of that scenario. You can do conservation research, have a species that is intended for conservation research, and these animals are not released uh, or intended to be released. They're part of research projects that benefit conservation, whether it's nutritional research, reproduction research, uh, husbandry research, and some zoos have uh, programs in, in that fall into this category. Conservation education is probably the most common uh, program types in zoos and aquaria, and these are animals that are not going to be released. They are there in order to connect, offer a connection of people to nature, uh, raise awareness, inspire your guests, motivate behavioral changes, positive behavioral changes through conservation. Uh, and again, this is what nature centers and many zoos and school programs have. Our animals fall into this category. And then there's another other category of, which includes farming and mass production facilities of animals. Uh, these are not, um, we are not really into this category and those have unique disease risk challenges that we won't cover here. Now, the other factor is location of the facility um, within the native range or not. And nature centers tend to be yes. Uh, most zoos and aquariums tend to be a no um, because most aquaria and zoos have a variety of different species from different parts of the world. And then the type of facility that you have, it's like you can be either what's called a cosmopolitan facility, which you maintain multiple species, uh, which is what most zoos and aquariums are. And then you can have an isolation type species which are species, the species that are kept are limited to those within the, that are natural, that, whose natural range is within the location of the facility. And then again, some nature centers, school programs, so on and so forth. We'll go through some of the examples. This is the matrix that you follow. I have to break this down. Uh, it looks a little complicated, but it basically at every point, it tells you, you land at either you should do an isolation protocol or, you, or you're okay with best practices. And so let's take a couple examples. The first one is using a, let's take a bullfrog, for example, American bullfrog, not an endangered species. Uh, it's, it's, let's say it's living in a wetland exhibit at a US zoo. There's no plan to release the animal or offsprings. It has an education role, it's a single species. Uh, if you follow the, uh, the tree, it basically brings you down to uh, best practices. So you apply best practices type of uh, biosecurity and you should be okay with that. Now, uh, example number two, say the Wyoming toads, which are um, an endangered species, and you have uh, a number of these animals collected in the wild and establish an assurance population in a U.S. zoo somewhere. Uh, the offsprings, the intent of the offsprings is to be released to support um, the species in the wild. So these fall under the category of an ARC rescue or assurance populations. Typically, you're not going to be, the zoo is not going to be in the native range of these animals. And so, and they're going to have a cosmopolitan collection of other species that are going to be around in the zoo. So the recommendation, if you follow the uh, tree, lands you on, you're going to have to have an isolation protocol in order to, to minimize the risk of these animals being a vector of disease out into the wild. So you apply isolation protocols. Now, the whole purpose of these, uh, of these, programs is to block the entry of pathogens or exit of pathogens from a facility. 
So uh, how do you do this? You do this by training. You establish operating protocols. Uh, it has to be accessible, up to date, reviewed by staff. It's not, again, this is not a tool to punish somebody when something happens. These are tools that minimize the risk of something happening at your facility. And when it does happen, which it will, uh, it encourages error reporting and it encourages fine tuning of that perm. So it becomes a, a sort of a living document where you um, actually um, manage that. Um, it also establishes protocols for hygiene and sanitation uh, of the staff, uh, particularly if you are pushing it into the isolation type setup where you have dedicated protective clothing for each unit and footwear. Um, and then changing uh, gloves, anything that can be a point of contact between one unit and another. Uh, these are some examples of having um, foot cover. Um, most places are shying away now from the presence of foot baths uh, because you don't, um, because foot baths uh, have, require a lot of maintenance. Uh, any of this, if you know anything about disinfectants is that they become in, uh, inactivated by organic materials so you want to they're going to require a lot of maintenance so if anything uh, a foot bath what it does is it, it just gives you a mental uh, indicator that there's a barrier there that you cannot cross without actually thinking about what you're about to do so uh, basic if you work at a zoo um, or a, a, an animal facility you want to have dedicated clothing if you're going to apply best practices scenario you want to have an overall gloves disposable gloves non-porous um, footwear that you can, that will keep you from, um, from taking any diseases from one area to another. And this is just basic cleanliness. So this is a pretty, pretty robust system. And then, um, you know, whether it's a costume that you have at the zoo or, uh, or dedicated clothing, et cetera. And then if you ramp it up one more step in order to apply isolation and necrops, and for necropsy, we do this as well uh, to prevent any pathogen transfer. So workflow has to be logical. Uh, and again, these, this isn't, there's not a single program that works for everybody. You have to design these, taking into account all these little principles. So logical and efficient workflow, animals under isolation must be tended to first because that way you prevent the possibility of transferring something from other animals into this isolated group if you cannot have a dedicated keeper. Uh, animals in quarantine tended to last because you don't want anything that could potentially be in these animals in quarantine to be spread to your collection. And then you have to absolutely complete all work in one unit before you move to the next. Uh, again, the purpose of defining these biological units is so that you can have dedicated um, materials for these. So tools for cleaning, um, uh, feeding utensils, all these things must be dedicated to each unit. You can't pass them one to the other without actually disinfecting them beforehand. And the enclosures must be easy, you know, design must be easy, that, that goes without saying. Uh, you never, ever, ever pass substrate or cage furniture between units because that is a point of transfer of pathogens. Wastes, uh, well, you can, uh, solid waste is a high risk. That means anything from the moss in the enclosure, the dirt, the, the planting, all those things are high risk. And also the water, you have water flowing through a lot of the amphibian exhibits and enclosures. And though the water can carry out uh, not just things like chytrid spores, but it can be a, a, a source for ranavirus, it can be a source for nematodes, uh, parasites, ciliates, and so on, so forth, bacteria. So a lot of the water is actually discharged into the sanitary sewer, so it is actually treated. Um, if it is going to be discharged into the environment, you have to treat it with something, uh, whether it's a disinfectant, see, see, uh, have it uh, treated with UV light or bleach or something like that. Uh, solid waste can be incinerated or buried or autoclaved um, or disposed as medical waste. But just keep in the back of your mind that it's not just what you bring into, into your enclosures, but whatever's coming out of there is also important. And then uh, the design of facilities is, is sort of to keep the animals in and the native fauna out, insect proof, because the insects can be disease vectors. And if you can automate anything like the misters, uh, lights, um, ozonation of water, uh, et cetera, that can all be automated, then it, it removes a chance for error. So you have a little bit more of a, of a standardized approach and setup. And we're keeping in mind that food for the animals can be a source of pathogens. So wild caught insects can be problematic. Um, and if you can culture your own insects at a nutrition facility, uh, you then also 
limit, minimize the risk of pathogens, but also you increase your risk for nutritional disorders. So nothing is ever straightforward and simple. So let's let's do a little bit of a, a simulation here, uh, just to keep in the back here, to keep to put it in your in perspective how easy it is to transfer pathogens. And again, this is a foam. Uh, fake frog that we use for presentations. And the white powder on the top of the frog, that's actually, it's baby powder, but we'll call it a disease X. Uh, it can be something like chytrid that it can be very easily transmissible. So you do an exam on this frog, you appropriately have gloves on and you have dedicated clothing. Um, this do exhibit strangely looks like someone's apartment, but um, say you touch this frog and you do the exam and the frog is fine. And, uh, but now you have that disease um, potentially on your hand. Um, so what happens next is your phone rings or you want to grab your keys out of your pocket or something and now you pass that disease, potentially you spread that disease onto your pants, you open a drawer, you can actually spread that disease, you grab your phone and you have that disease, boy these pictures are old, those phones are way old. Um, but there's, these are all points of transfer, of potential transfer of that disease from one animal out into, um, out of your control. Uh, and even if you do the right thing and you take your gloves off before you go see another animal, um, let's say represented by this frog that now has some cool shades and no disease, uh, you have clean gloves and so you're doing the right thing. But if you open that drawer now, um, potentially picked up your phone or shifted your keys from another pocket, now your hands are become a vector for that disease and you can result in, in spreading a disease into, the, into an unintended um, animal. So just keeps in the back of the mind, even though you think you're doing the right thing, um, everything from the point you touch an animal uh, on is a potential risk of transmission. So it's not just the gloves, uh, changing gloves is actually everything you touch. And disinfecting surfaces, uh, we, we are with this in this new um, age that we live in with uh, you know, COVID-19, it, it's become much more um, evident how easy it is to transmit this. So Talking a little bit about cleaning and disinfection, um, cleaning guidelines for, for best practices include removal of feces and food items, uh, uneaten food items in the enclosure, flushing of the substrate. This is actually facilitated by false bottom uh, amphibian tanks uh, because you get to flush out and reduce the parasite burden. Otherwise, you, you can mitigate this by um, having uh, more frequent changes of enclosure. Uh, having disposable substrates you can keep for one or two days, reusable substrate. Uh, you should replace daily, but in, in, in an ideal world, you would have two sets that you can pass animals from one to the other while the other one disinfects. And if you have organic subst substrates, which is what we do for most amphibian enclosures, um, it, you, it should never be reused. You should dispose it once you switch the exhibit. To disinfect, and the difference between cleaning and disinfecting is that cleaning is removal of organic material of a surface. Disinfection is removing viable microorganisms from that surface. So there's a slight but a very important difference. So difference between the two. So to disinfect enclosures, you got to do a substrate change. Uh, you definitely want to disinfect the enclosure if you have a disease outbreak, and then you want to disinfect before you reuse. If you're going to reuse any materials, you want to disinfect now. Disinfecting uh, tools and equipments is very important. Uh, and you wanna make sure that you rinse the disinfectant off of the, um, the soaps and disinfectants off of the equipment that you're gonna use. Because a lot of these chemical compounds are very irritating to sensitive skin of amphibians, for example. Um, so disinfection, again, we talked about it a little bit. This, it's the, uh, these are antimicrobial agents that destroy microorganisms on inanimate surfaces. We're not sterilizing anything, we're disinfecting it. And for, the, for effective disinfection, you have to take into account two, um, two very important principles. One is the concentration of the solution, um, and the other one is the contact time. This one is the most neglected factor uh, in, the, in the process of disinfection. Um, when you look at a naturalistic, beautiful enclosure such as this for amphibians, uh, disinfecting natural elements is almost impossible. Um, the disinfectants that we use would definitely kill off the plants. Um, and then the dirt and substrate with it, organic matter that's in there would neutralize most disinfectants. So there's not one method that's effective in all microbes in all situations. You gotta use a, choose the combination of physical and chemical disinfectants depending on your situation and your um, facility. 
So it's just examples of a couple of, a few of these uh, chemical disinfectants, bleach, um, quaternary ammonia, like um, no, uh, some of the quaternary ammonia that we use. Uh, they're both cheap and readily available and they're effective. Um, bleach can be corrosive to metal surfaces and is a contact irritant. Um, quaternary ammonia tend to inactivate very quickly by soap, even so you, that's why you have to rinse fairly well. Um, very common is one that we used in uh, one of our institutions, it's very effective. It has minimal environmental toxicity and resists inactivation, but it has a very short half-life. Once you mix it, you only have about a week to use that solution before it no longer has any effect. Chlorhexidine is commonly used, as cheap as it's more of a soap, um, but contact time is long. And something like ethanol can be used too. This is effective for instruments, tools, and equipment. It's not corrosive, but it's a really a very, a very irritating to the skin of amphibians. So again, you gotta balance what you use and the effectiveness of it with the effect on your animals. This is uh, directly from that manual, and it shows a little bit of the contact time required um, for the, each of the target pathogens. So you do have to take into account the concentration and the contact time as well as the pathogen that you want to target. So if you're looking at chytrid fungus versus rhinovirus, ethanol, 70% ethanol for one minute will kill chytrid fungus. Uh, Vircon at 1% for a minute will kill it. But if you look at something like bleach, um, a 0.4% a solution takes about 10 minutes to, um, to kill a chytrid fungus. A 1% solution does it pretty quickly, but it's pretty irritating. Um, when you look at something like a physical method of this of disinfection, like complete drying of a surface, uh, it will take about three hours to kill chytrid fungus. So uh, a lot of it is time dependent and your facility is uh, dependent. Physical, other physical disinfection methods are include heat and pressure, which is basically an autoclave, which is what we use. It's really good and effective for um, equipment, metal equipment. Uh, it, will, it will melt plastics, so you gotta be careful with that. Uh, it's effective against most pathogens. It does take time. Dehydration is actually, we do this every day when we wash our dishes, uh, we set them up to dry. It's very, very low cost. It's very highly efficient. And it, um, it results, it's a death in most animal, uh, most bacteria by desiccating and it inactivates viruses and so on and so forth. Uh, but it takes a long time. Uh, ultraviolet is very effective water disinfectant. You do need specialized equipment and that can be expensive. And ozone is commonly used in aquaria settings, to disinfect water, and it's very effective. But again, the cost of equipment can be expensive. Personal hygiene uh, is really important so that you do not become a vector of disease. Uh, and that, again, goes with dedicated work clothes, uh, shoes, uh, gloves, hand washing. Again, um, now we're very, very familiar with this uh, principle of washing your hands for about 20 seconds. Soap is remarkably effective at reducing or minimizing the possibility of uh, infectious disease transfer. So, and again, foot baths not the best because they require a lot of um, a lot of care. Now, as we're wrapping up, let's talk a little bit about quarantine uh, and what it is and what it does. And so, quarantine is, is is practice designed to restrict the movement of clinical health. What apparently is a clinically healthy individual that may have its own uh, communicable diseases, its pathogen flora that it lives with, in order to observe for the development of potential clinical signs. It is very different than isolation. Uh, isolation involves the physical separation of an individual with a communicable disease from those that are healthy. So uh, in quarantine, you, you assume that there may be a potential disease, but that the animal is actually healthy. When you do um, isolation, it's because you have an animal that's ill and you want to isolate it. So the, the word of quarantine actually comes from the 40 days ships were required to be isolated before coming to shore. So you just park the ship right by port and uh, people would just live on the ship for 40 days. And if there was an out, that gives the opportunity if there's an outbreak of disease about to happen, that it happens in a contained location like the ship. And it doesn't happen when the, when the people or the animals would be already in the facility. A quarantine also has a very unique purpose, uh, which is, which many of you, um, are familiar with, which it allows the animal to acclimate to a new environment, diet, management style, training programs, new smells, new weather patterns, etc. It is also a time where you can document health status of the animal. So you get the animal in there and you have a period of time where you can observe it and figure out that it's healthy, what its behaviors, what, um, you know, is it lame, is it walking, is it, uh, does it need additional care? 
Um, and it's an opportunity to perform medical and diagnostic tests. One and that, once an animal is released into an enclosure with other animals and mixed species exhibits, uh, in order to recover that animal, it takes an enormous amount of work and it's potentially stressful and potential for injury of the animal uh, goes up. So again, uh, in order to set up an effective quarantine, you actually have to be familiar with the requirements of the species. So you're bringing an animal in uh, and you wanna make sure that you can address any of the basic needs for that species, whereas temperature, UV light, um, if species are more cryptic and they're gonna be stressed by being in a plain, um, you know, paper towel uh, um, tank, um, th those things you have to consider in order, and not just the species, but also the individual propensities as well. Because it's the, the quarantine period can be a very stressful period. And that's where you apply that risk assessment matrix again, um, taking into account that the source of the incoming animal, if it comes from a cosmopolitan facility with multiple other species, the risk is higher. If it's wild caught, the risk is higher that it has a particular disease. If it's coming from an isolation program where you have uh, a, a, something like the Kihansi spray toad room, those animals were the, 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 the health concerns for those animals is very low because you know those animals, the risk of those animals being exposed to other things is very low. If you know the history, medical history of the animal, your risk goes lower. Uh, if you have known medical history, you, you know, these animals come from a, uh, um, say, a reptile fair or something like that. Um, or from the wild, your your uh, your risk goes higher. Um, if you have uh, if you identify significant pathogens at the time of quarantine, your risk goes way up. Um, whereas if you have opportunistic pathogens as the only thing you find, your risk get, continues to go low. So in order to manage quarantine, um, again having fully dedicated staff would be ideal for a quarantine scenario, but that's unrealistic in most uh, facilities. Uh, animals in quarantine should be tended to last. So if you have animals at a, say, at a hospital in your zoo facility and you have your animals at the hospital and you have animals in quarantine, you deal with the animals in the hospital first and then you go do uh, service the animals in quarantine and feed the animals in quarantine. That should be done last. Um, you also avoid set up the quarantine in places where you can avoid routine transit because that increases, again, the possibility of transfer of pathogens by door handles or by drawers or um, just simple contact like that. And areas uh, in quarantine must be kept under a isolation biosecurity protocol because what you're trying to do is keep everything in the area. So, um, and again, you don't, once you start a quarantine period, you, whatever that is for the species that you're dealing with, it's an all in, all out. You do not add more species. You do not take out some animals and leave the others to finish quarantine. Everything goes in at the same time and everything goes out at the same time. And that's how you manage that program. Oh, we may lose the connection again. I think I only have a couple of slides, um, something like samples left. If we do lose the connection, we will retake it. I think there's a 40 minute time cycle period on this, uh, on Zoom. All right, we have about 10 minutes left. So um, we'll move forward a little bit quicker. And again, once your animals leave quarantine, you wanna make sure that you have complete cleaning and disinfection between, uh, between groups of animals. Um, exit process is through uh, having a, a satisfactory medical exam, a good body condition and healthy, no recorded mortalities, negative for pathogens of concern. That's why you test some things in quarantine. And uh, just never uh, underestimate the value of a potential necropsy uh, for to assess um, to assess the the to assess the stat the health status of these animals uh, during quarantine. So let's do a little uh, example, um, and this will highlight a few things. Uh, dying poison dart frogs are a very pretty South American species of frogs. They're listed as vulnerable and they're um, used for the, uh, they're popular because of the pet trade. Um, we had this group that got, uh, was part of a confiscation in uh, an illegal uh, transfer. So we brought them in. Again, they were set up in a, um, in a particular location uh, and under a, an isolation protocol. And they developed these rostral mandibular lesions that actually we thought at first, these were the lesions that the animals were having. And, um, Unfortunately, the, the lesions were pretty deep and, and we lost some of these animals. Um, and so um, I'm not sure why it's trying to continue to move forward. 
but these are the lesions that they developed. And with that, uh, we became concerned because you can have these kinds of lesions and uh, for a number of reasons that, um, that include bacterial infections, trauma, UV light, so on and so forth. So um, again, it begs the question, you know, once you start down the path of a disease investigation, what are the, what's the reason for that? And if it's an infectious disease, it would be really concerning to release, to be able to, to have these animals join the collection in the and, and go past quarantine. Um, so it turns out what turned out the whole story was that um, these animals came in, they were set up in tanks. Um, we, you know, whoever set these tanks up didn't realize that this particular species was um, is a very territorial species. So what happened is that the tanks with the glass um, glass sides, the animals were able to see each other, and they would um, try to set up territories against each other. And so they would jump and smash their faces in uh, against the glass. So it turns out that this case was a, a simple traumatic injury. The solution came um, in the form of a, a very cheap cardboard dividers that we placed in between the tanks, and that um, the disease the manifestation of these uh, rostral lesions ended. So again, you have to know the basic requirements of that species. Uh, not everything that develops in an animal in quarantine is an infectious disease that you have to um, you know, treat with antibiotics. Like we could treat those, those rostral lesions, but unless we found the cause, we would never have resolved them. And, uh, and they'll keep an open mind at your quarantine that uh, things that could be as simple as putting a divider, dividing barrier, visual barrier between tanks is, is as simple as it, it was needed at the time. Now you want to make sure you measure UV lights and you, there's a number of, uh, this, this sounds very simple, but it was the construct of multiple, multiple levels of investigation that resulted in us actually finding what was going on. And uh, examples of this abund. Um, and with that, I am going to stop here. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention.